Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge, and welcome to Eldridge & Company. My friend Bill Perkins represents the Upper West Side and Central Harlem in the New York City Council, and he represents people from all over the city in the current budget negotiations. So let's talk about the budget. Hello. Hello, how are you? <laughs> okay. The budget. It's budget time again. Yes, it's the, uh, our favorite time of the year. Yeah. It's the time when we focus on the needs of the people of the city and try to uh, get our mayor and uh, our colleagues in the council to um, deal with some of the easy issues as it relates to the budget and then of course the great challenges particularly when it comes to the fiscal crisis and yeah. matters of that time. By law the fiscal year starts July 1 mm -hmm. in the city. In the state it's still April 1? In the state it's still April. And they but still they, haven't voted a budget yet. In the last right. 20 or more years they, they've always been late they've been late and by law our budget has to be balanced it has to be balanced uh, and we always balance it yeah. ever since the fiscal right. crisis of the of the, the 60s to 70s yeah. and um, 70s. we won't have a problem balancing it to the extent that there's any uh, uh, challenge to whether or not we're going to come up with a, an agreed upon budget between the council and the, and the mayor and 90% of the time, 99% of the time, yeah. we agree. Right. I think I've only remember once in my experience right. when we... And Giuliani in one year. Yeah. Um, the budget um, is proposed by the mayor. The first round, a preliminary budget comes in at the end of February or sometime like that. The city has city council <laughs> hearings on it. Then it makes recommendations to that proposal. The mayor supposedly takes into consideration those recommendations that the council makes. And the council makes them after having public hearings, right? and then comes back with a final proposal, which he's now done. So now you're starting, or are you in the midst of, or have you finished city council hearings on the budget? Actually, we just finished on uh, yesterday, which is uh, Tuesday, Monday, uh, our uh, final executive budget hearings. And today, uh, Tuesday, we will be uh, meeting this afternoon as a caucus uh, to begin to look at what we are going to prioritize uh, what are the main issues that we're going to be looking at to determine uh, what, you know, our negotiating strategy with the mayor. So in, the mayor is the only one that can estimate the revenues. So that's the one side of the budget of revenues, and the other side is expenses. We're now talking about the expense budget. Right. Um, and he estimates those revenues, and then you have to frame the budget within that estimate. Within the estimate that he's given us, and that becomes challenging because his estimates are normally not uh, accurate. They're normally a little bit of a shortchanging uh, in terms of what's really there. We have the independent budget office and other budget watchdogs that uh, provide us with some insight as to what might actually be the real number. And part of the budget negotiations is to try to uh, tease out what the real number is. But the charter gives the mayor an extraordinary amount of power in terms of being able to exactly determine, you know, what. So the, it's the, interesting because in the in the Times on Tuesday today, and we're going to have the program airing tomorrow. Um, they say that what happened is there's a 1.5 billion dollar surplus. That's not in his. That's for this current fiscal year. It's not for the fiscal year. I just realized it's not for the fiscal year of the budget that you're adopting. It's right. the budget you've already adopted, which means that he underestimated the revenues. So you've got one and a half billion dollars excess in this year's. Budget. Well, that sounds like we can keep the libraries open a little longer. Well, can you carry <laughs> Actually, that money we, we, over, or will that money go to debt services? It, we'll have to make that determination yeah, it's a very when we get together. But it's an interesting thing. It is interesting, I and mean, it's a lot of money, though it doesn't seem like that in the scheme of you know uh, things in a way. But it's a lot of money. It's a it's a major. Uh, uh, under undervaluing of the yeah. of the amount of taxes that are coming right. in, clearly it's appreciated. I mean, extra money is always good, and we'll figure out what we're going to do with it. Um, we would like, to, obviously, to be able to spend some of it on 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 the next fiscal year, if possible. Uh, we may use it to s take care of some debts that we yeah. have. And we pay a lot of money, but a large part of the budget goes to oh. what they call debt service, which is paying the interest on. Loans, loans and, 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 and stuff that and bonds, bonds and whatnot that we've taken out over the past in order to stay afloat and, and also we, as you know we have a significant capital budget uh, that is basically uh, financed through loans and whatnot right. and then of course uh, this year one of the exciting things that's happening for the council for the first time is that we will be voting on the capital budget the five-year capital plan 
for the Board of Education, or rather now the Department of Education. And that's going to be an interesting source of, uh, of negotiations. And the because. capital plan involves all kinds of construction and permanent equipment that they... Particularly if the, if with the education budget, it will be for schools. Uh -huh. And school-related capital projects, like in school mm -hmm. buildings, technology, yeah. Um, other Improve, kinds of uh, hardware that might yeah. or improvements that might be needed, and so uh, there's some differences that are emerging already with respect to the mayor's plan and, and what we might consider to be a priority. That's interesting. Do you? How big is the budget? Forty-seven billion dollars. Now explain this. I was in the city council up until the year two thousand and one, three years ago. It seems to me when I was there, the budget was thirty-four billion dollars. What? What's the increase? Is it? The increase in renegotiated contracts, union contracts. Well, it some can't of it is that. some of it is contracts. Uh, some of it is just the cost of the services that we're providing are, are going up, uh, and then and to some extent we may be providing even more services that we may not have been providing before. I mean, there are new initiatives that uh, we've been t taking, a little, and, and they may not be uh, billions of dollars per se, but they add up and. But it's a lot. It's a lot well, of money. <laughs> it's, it is a lot, but it's only $4 billion more. I mean, there's... No, it's $10 billion. $10 billion I mean, from $14 billion. If it was $34 billion, you've got to go back there and look at this and see where, where this increase is. <clears throat> it was $34 billion when I was there, and now it's $47 billion. $34 when you left? Yeah, I think so. No, it was, yes. a, little bit, it was a little bit more than that. Well, yeah. right, but there has been ago. an increase in, uh, you know, government costs. And, of course, and, a lot of it, I don't know what the yeah. expenses that the city carries after 9-11. Well, but most of that I there's, thought there's, was there's clearly right. some. Well, the federal government isn't really giving right. giving us all the money right. that we should, should be getting yeah. for, uh, for for that. We never got the twenty billion dollars, for, for instance, yeah. that the federal government promised. That, but uh, the costs are go just are going up, and uh, the, you know it's not as if uh, the, you know the world has stopped in terms of what it what it costs to provide these services. It's an uh, incredible it, increase. Um, what's interesting me is. That when I was in the council, I used to complain, and you, you, you did it too, a lot, that the council wasn't proactive enough, that we really weren't exerting the kind <laughs> of power that we could. And now we have a mayor who says the council is too active. It's an interesting kind of thing. It seems to me we've shifted from one emphasis to the other. What, do you, what's, what happens? I mean, the council is elected. People are representing about 140,000, 150,000 voters, right? got 51 members of the city council and that is a legislative body that has a lot of power it has a lot of power and I think this is a, a council that may be for, for the first time in a long time making an impression uh, contrary to the notion that the city council uh, doesn't make an impression doesn't do anything well this is a council that's quite the opposite It's doing quite a bit um, and is doing good work for the people of the city of New York um, and uh, I don't think that the council is doing too much. In fact, that some of us might think the council should I be doing more. Uh, but of course, this mayor, as, as it is the case with many mayors, believes that what the mayor wants, the mayor should get. And so uh, in the past, that has been pretty consistent, except in this case, now there are more vetoes and there's more uh, overrides and, and there's more new initiatives that are coming out of the council that the mayor doesn't always agree with. And more appeals, I guess, in the court system, too. A lot of these things, aren't they, for taking the mayor's prerogative or something like that? You well, were the lead person on one of the major yeah. laws that he's criticizing. Yeah, the, the lead bill, for instance, yeah. uh, he's trying to take to the courts. And um, again, that, that bill uh, has a cost attached to it. There are many bills that we pass that have costs attached to it. And that may account to some extent for your, your question about where the additional costs coming from. It's the cost of, of, of legislation and government. And he's taking us to court because he believes that the bill is in violation of, of some environmental review procedures, which he's absolutely wrong about. That cost, <laughs> that's going to cost us. And what is it's it an gonna, unnecessary you know what cost. It's, oh, well, the, I don't mean the appeal in the court, but what is the, the cost of the of the legislation. Well, you know, they, they came in saying it's going to cost $250 million. They were clearly exaggerating. Now they've come in and said it's going to cost $100 million. Again, we believe they're exaggerating. Just the other day, I, I was told by the uh, commissioner for the Department of Homeless Services that it's going to cost her $30 million, though she's only asked for $17 million. We have independent uh, budget analysts telling us it shouldn't cost more than $30 million. What is it that's going to cause the cost? Well, um, 
they're they're not going to be the cost of the type I mean, that they're claiming. What's the legislation about? It's essentially uh, requiring landlords to do remediation. It's essentially requiring the city to do more inspections. It's a, and, and it's essentially uh, imposing on the city to actually do the remediation if, in fact, the landlords are so delinquent. Uh, so there are costs associated with that, but not the kind of costs, for instance, that might have been associated uh, with the law that is presently on the books, which is Local Law 1, in which the remediation would require that all the walls uh, of any uh, lead-based paint apartment uh, be um, redone. In this case, you just have to deal with those parts of the, uh, the apartment, uh, that particular part of the, of, of the apartment, that wall, that one wall or two or whatever. And so it's a much more modest cost What's by comparison. What's the level of lead that has to be, I mean, that triggers this whole action, do you know? Uh, Fifteen uh, micro something somethings, millimeters, you know, uh, is the, what, what triggers it. And so, this is the problem that people live in old housing that has been painted over for many years, especially Actually, when paint came with lead. Is that what? Yeah, it? pre-1960 apartments um, and facilities uh, that uh, came online were, for the most part, painted with lead-based paint. And since then, uh, the laws have outlawed the use of such paint, and so now uh, we don't have the problem with the with a significant uh, amount of the stock, but there's still a lot in certain communities of, of this type that has to be dealt with. So, how much is it going to cost? I, I would say uh, they're saying 100. I would say it's going to be much less than that. And what what is the commissioner of homeless services? Why do they have to spend money? Do they have shelters? They have shelters, and they use scatter site housing. Um, so they're and other most likely to, to use the older housing. They're likely to use the older housing. And they're using and, older facilities. And uh, hotels that they may yeah. be using. And, 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 and so they have to test for the paint now. Do they, they have to test the agency? To, the, the agency has to test to the extent that it's city facilities and or the owners have to test to the extent that uh, is private uh, property. But nevertheless, they have to intervene as well. And all of this is important because people who live in an environment that has a high content of lead in the paint or the peeling or whatever, um, suffer um, medical problems. Sure, they, uh, they are permanently damaged. And it's uh, mental retardation? Mental retardation, uh, other physical uh, uh, crippling. Um, you know, very often you'll find uh, the children of, uh, who have been poisoned by lead are the children who are in special ed. So there are billions of dollars of social costs associated with And I've always with believed the people in prison, if we were to well, test them, that there would be a high level of lead. Protect, of lead. Well, they may have had it in earlier years, yeah. but by the time they are our age and, and at the prison age, it's probably not affecting them as much. It's only the, the, the it's really most effective on, or has its greatest impact for children under seven. But I know, but it's a permanent impact unless they are treated. It's a permanent impact. That's what I meant. That yes, they it's grew a, oh, up in the a poor. It's, yeah. a, it's without a yeah, doubt. It's right. a permanent impact from that point of view. Yeah. And, and I would. And you're right. I wouldn't be surprised if the, if you if you looked at the prison population, you'll find some history of lead in, in many of those cases. But you know, from a budgetary point of view, that's one of the the significant issues that we're going to be dealing with. Um, that, you know, is going to have some impact on 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 what we do. There are going to be quite a few others. That, what other issues? Well, Do you as I think mentioned, that the administration is not addressing enough. Uh, well, I mean, there's <laughs> there's some concerns about uh, infant mortality, that the, the funding for infant mortality, HIV/AIDS is, is, has not gone away. It's in fact uh, raging in, in some communities. Public, the public libraries. Uh, there's a there's a potential that we'll have the public library have, using less days, three, four days in some cases. In the worst of fiscal crises, David Dinkins, as the mayor, kept the libraries open six days a week. Uh, this budget that's being proposed by the mayor suggests quite the opposite. We have a surplus, as you just mentioned, and yet he's c uh, considering cuts. In fact, significantly different with this mayor than in the past is he doesn't identify what he's doing as cuts. He's, he's saying that there are no cuts, that it's just not been baselined and that these are uh, council initiatives uh, that were in the budget that he's taking out of the budget but doesn't consider that to and be And this is the trick that people should understand, is that every year, for many years, the budgets come down, and because the council is very democratic and interested in issues that the recent mayors have not been so interested in, those cuts that more or less affect poor people 
And because the council is interested in its local communities, it's always um, provided money for cultural, mm -hmm. um, uh, different cultural projects and stuff. Those are the things that the mayors cut with the knowledge that the council puts them back in each year. Sometimes the, mayor, the council puts something into the budget and the mayor might say, yes, this is a good idea. So that's what we call baselining. Then mm -hmm. it comes in to the budget automatically every year. It becomes part of the mayor's budget, right? Right. But there's always a game because the, the mayor always cuts the favorite programs of the council, and the council always has to come back and do it. It used to be recycling. Well, Re and recycling is now back. It was cut. It's always confusing to people. What was that? It was recycling. Libra libraries, cultural institutions. Civilian personnel in the police uh, department. Civilian personnel, <laughs> senior citizen centers. Yeah. Uh, the meals. The, yeah, all yeah. the youth programs, summer meals. youth employment pro programs. And they're all out, and you have to put them we all back in. have to put them in. back in. So that's the negotiation. They usually come up to about $200 million of our cut of cuts with respect to initiatives that the council determines to be a priority. And the negotiation is usually about how do we get those back in, and then how do we enhance or, uh, those, those projects, or how do we get new initiatives uh, in the budget. And so we're going to see what we can do now. Um, it's too bad this 1.5 is not as available right. as we would like it yeah, to be. Yeah, that is. Now, this is the time of year that people go down and hang out at City Hall. It's a great time. What happens now with the more restrictive admission things? You're still able to go through and sit outside, or what happens? You're, you're able to get in. Of course, it's, it's a little bit more cumbersome, um, especially since the, uh, the, uh, the death of James Davis. There's been a lot more scrutiny in terms of bags and how, what people bring in with them. But the lobbyists are still there, and this is the, actually, in a way, the, 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 the best part of the whole budgetary process from the perspective of the lobbyists, the community-based organizations, the, the individuals that are coming down uh, to make a case for their communities and for their, uh, for their organizations, the advocates. It's really a, a wonderful ex example of democracy. It's a and, total marketplace of all the different issues and things. It is right. a great time. And so you get the position papers on, on a sheet, and you, and you get to really learn a lot about uh, what's going on in the city in terms of how the, t the dollars are being spent and where they should be spent and the types of programs and types of services that are out there. It is a hassle sometimes because we're very busy and we're trying to run in and out, but before you can get into City Hall, you have to go through a phalanx <laughs> of uh, these lobbyists and advocates. But it's a, it's a wonderful expression, I think, and it's something that should not be curbed. It's something that actually should be encouraged. As a matter of fact, over the years, this may account for the difference between when you were there, when you left, and, and now. Uh, we've had uh, an enormous increase in the number of folks that are coming down, folks who did not really uh, believe they had any access or any opportunity to represent themselves. Uh, we're finding, you know, new faces all the time. There's always faces. that narrow line at this time of year, and I guess in the federal government, too, at the time that they adopt the budget, of what they call the pork barrel items that the members put in. And you want to be, sh and, and I would really say, even if I don't approve of a lot of the members, that many of the things the members put in are very valuable and very crucial to people's lives and it's where it's really what happens around the corner from you that's most sure. clearly affected it's well you know we're, we're required to represent a very specific area um, and to bring home the bacon if you will uh, to uh, to address the concerns of the people in the neighborhoods um, and very often uh, what we see as parochial is tends to be actually uh, more global in right. terms of the, the whole city. Uh, so very often what you might think as a priority for your neighborhood, uh, you will find your colleagues uh, signing on to it uh, because it is something that uh, can benefit their community. It's definitely well. true. And what the problems that you find in the neighborhood are definitely very often citywide. Let's just talk like a little bit. Like rats, for instance. Yeah, I mean, oh, rats are a big <laughs> issue. You chair the, the Government Operations Committee, so that's a, a very interesting committee because it's about how the government works, mm -hmm. right, and the, all the different things. Let's talk a little bit about politics. Sure. Um, do the Republican members of the council truly support Bush for president? Oh, yes. They love Bush. Yeah. <laughs> they love... So we Bush. don't really have moderate Republicans in the council anymore. Um, no, we, we, we don't have what I would call moderate Republicans. I think that they, they're very uh, supportive of the Republican Party and, and Bush and, and, and they're very supportive of uh, Pataki, sometimes not so supportive of, of Bloomberg, but no one thinks of Bloomberg as a, as a real Republican. And, and so but there's some resentment uh, within the Republican Party. Uh, 
I think sometimes towards Bloomberg from that point that's, of view. That's a very interesting point because the Democrats, I think, are really angry at, at Bloomberg for well, being Bloomberg a Republican. Very, is, and has been very consistent from our point of view with the Republican yeah, agenda and has right. been very silent very often in criticizing the governor and, and the president when they have fallen short in terms of their responsibilities budgetary-wise, money-wise, uh, for the people of the city of New and York. And fundraised for them. And has fundraised for them in his home. And, and is it. now hosting this Democratic convention here. For I them. mean, the Republican yes. convention. Yeah. So that's posing a problem. Does that jurisdiction come under you? It doesn't really, does it? To some extent, it does. You know, we, as a matter of fact, are planning on having hearings around the whole question of the permits. As mm -hmm. you know, there's been some uh, applications to have uh, uh, demonstrations gather uh, in the Great Lawn in Central Park. Uh, at this point, the uh, police department has rejected those applications, and it doesn't seem to have uh, approved any applications yet for any kinds of demonstrations. So we're going to be having some hearings uh, to try to understand what's going on. Uh, I'm opposed to the rejection of the application uh, for the use of Central Park Lawn. I think it's a great lawn for, for a great uh, time in, in our democracy when they're debating who should become the president. And I, and I think the freedom of speech and, and the opportunity to assemble uh, is, is more important uh, than whether or not the lawn will be destroyed. The lawn will not be destroyed. One of the things that's happening right now, as a matter of fact, in our budget negotiations is that in anticipation of the Republican National Convention, there are certain policing and other types of needs. And so the police department is saying to us, give us a few extra dollars because we're going to need to put more police on for overtime. The parks department, by the same token, can say, look, if you're going to use the lawn, we're going to have to refurbish it. So we exactly. need to put extra money in the budget, and we're prepared to do that. Uh, for the sake of allowing to equate full expression. reseeding or replanting a lawn with protecting free speech and the right to assemble is a very uneven equation. It's not a, yeah, it's uneven because essentially the the I, the, I believe that the uh, interest is in curbing uh, the political uh, opposition. Right. Uh, the, to the Republicans um, and, and, and the convention, and so it's not a a, 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 a gardening issue, <laughs> or it's it's what I think is really a political agenda uh, that's being expressed. It's an interesting question also because it's the Conservancy, which is a private foundation that raises money, and I think still does not open its minutes and business to the public. I don't think you have any, the Parks Department, the Parks Committee, for instance, has oversight into what happens in the Conservancy, is under contract to the Parks Department to maintain Central Park. They do a wonderful job. It is a beautiful park, but it's a public park. It's not a private park. And I wondered if any of those questions have surfaced again. When we first started that park with the Conservancy, there were some questions, but we never really, if I remember, never really had... Well, I remember there were questions. Uh, I wasn't in the council at the time, but I was a part of those who was concerned about uh, the privatization mm -hmm. of the park in terms of this contract between the parks department and uh, the conservancy and, and, and the ability uh, of the public to have some say as to what should and should not be happening to this private uh, mm -hmm. entity that had no accountability uh, necessarily to the public. Uh, the Conservancy, as I'm not sure, is ultimately the one that's making this decision. It would be interesting to find out uh, it, well, from the commissioner uh, when he comes before us who final, makes the final decision about the use of the park in, in an instance like this. You or is it the, uh, the chair or the executive director of the Conservancy? And then, of course, we can ask the Conservancy the same question. But I think that fundamentally uh, they're making a mistake. I think that once you begin to say that this can't be used because it's it's going to destroy the beauty of it at the at, at the expense of, of freedom of speech then why that argument can play out on any street on any other venue uh, that we might have it's very very uh, slippery slope that I think we're yeah. on we have very few a few minutes um, do you think it makes a difference if there's a Democratic mayor along with the council we're gonna have an election after this election <clears throat> uh, I assume you're supporting John Kerry of course, yeah. of course, of um, course. So let's move on to the mayoralty. <laughs> <laughs> Though I'm really uh, was supporting Dean yes. to begin with. Did you but run as a delegate? I ran as a delegate. Yes, yes. so did I. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a, it's too was bad. A, yeah. Well, I mean, we have to beat Bush. Kerry, I think, is is the better of the two, um, and we have to help Kerry uh, be as representative of the, of a progressive agenda as possible, um, and fortify his candidacy from that perspective, because otherwise. You're not going to excite the base of the, of, of the party, and, and, and you can't take it for granted. 
in terms of the Democrat uh, uh, for, for, um, for mayor, clearly you have a significant difference. Um, I think that if you had a Democrat for mayor, you probably would, would have a mayor that would speak more for uh, the return uh, of the commuter tax. Um, which has been a crippling, has had a crippling effect on our We ability haven't talked about, I just remembered it, we have less than two minutes. We haven't talked about the property tax. Are uh, you for the rebate of $400 or whatever it is or not? Well, frankly, I'm not sure that we uh, should be uh, rebating or tax cutting at all. I've always felt hesitant about uh, returning money uh, as if it's a great gift, and in the meantime, the two or $300 million that we take out of the budget is, t is being taken from some other like service, some fundamentally school, important lunches. service that, 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 that I think makes it for a better city. Yes, I want you to have as much money as you can, as you can have, but how can you then talk about a $3.6 billion deficit, fiscal deficit, uh, in, 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 the year, in the out year of 2006? So we're not really out of the woods yet, and I'm not quite sure if either of the approaches right now is the most responsible approach for the people of the city of New York because again you're taking over three hundred million dollars out of the budget which can go to keeping your libraries open to fortifying your senior citizens programs uh... to maintaining your parks and your, 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 your other kind of services that uh, I think the people would benefit more from as opposed to maybe getting back a dollar well, a day. Well, I'm very glad to hear you say that, and I know that I can always rely on you <laughs> to agree with me because I believe we should not rebate. And thank you very much for coming yeah. again, and I hope we see you again soon. And good sure. luck with the budget. Sure, thank you And everything much. else. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Great.